everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Okay, here's my most recent conversation with Mr. Hall. Um, this one was... This one had a lot to do with feeling into something, right? And, and it had a lot to do with, the, you know, I just had a child and he's got, uh, I think, a two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old daughter. Um, so he connected a lot about what that is to respond and address a child. And of course, that leads to how to respond to being and things around holding and perceiving and attunement. And um, it was really, it was really a great conversation. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad you tuned in. I hope you enjoy it as well. Okay, so some housekeeping. So one, uh, an update is that the course that John Verbeke and Christopher Maso Trepo, I have to learn how to pronounce his name right, um, did a the D Logos Encircling course, which was a two day event, five hours a day, um, that was combining, essentially combining uh, mindfulness practices, circling inner subjective practices um, into philosophical dialogue. And we layered it in a particular way, in a particular order. And it was, this was the first time that we brought all this together and taught it. There's about, I think there's about 80, there's maybe 80 people in it. It's a really good turnout. And it was beyond our expectations. It was really quite, you know, on the breaks and stuff, uh, all three of us were, were struck by how difficult the material was and how meaningful the, everyone was experiencing and finding deep enjoyment in the struggle of learning it, let alone you know, accomplishing a lot and really getting it a lot. But it was really quite an ecstatic and grounded experience at the same time. So I have a feeling this will be the first. That was the first one, and there, there will be more. So stay tuned. I have a meeting with the three of us coming up um, next week, and I'm uh, to talk about what's next. But this, that course really kind of, you could say, took a lot of the things on the channel that we've been talking about and just put it, in straight up practice with everybody. And it was it's such an incredibly awesome group of people that showed up. I mean, re people were really, really a yes to it, right? Which is, um, doesn't always happen. If you've ever led courses or you've taught or anything like that, you know very well that not everyone always shows up um, uh, with such proactive willingness to learn. And this group, and I think it's telling, given the topic, um, or exemplified that openness of mind, heart, and um, beingness. So stay tuned, and I'll, I'll keep you updated on that. The circling part, the circling institute, we have a weekend, I think, coming up, a weekend intensive, I think, coming up in two or three weeks. Um, they, we have drop-in events every Thursday night. Um, so the links for for the Circling Institute, to dive into that, are all below. If you're interested in, in working with me personally, one-on-one, -on -one, I do do that with people, um, go ahead and email me, and that, well, is below. And uh, just let me know, put, put in, the, um, put in the, the subject line, coaching, and... And go ahead and email me, and, and, and I'll get in touch with you. And we'll, I'll, I'll cover costs and, you know, my style of working with people and all that kind of thing. All right. Enjoy. It's, it, I think, I, uh, my, I sense that you, there's a sweet spot you're feeling into with this. And I, I, my sense of it has something really crucial to do with a different relationship or maybe, maybe an older and a deeper relationship to um, place. 
Yeah, I think that's right. One of the things I've definitely noticed is, um, I mean, to be perfectly frank, in my particular case, um, I haven't, I never really had a home. Yeah. When I was growing up, uh, my dad was in the Air Force. And so we moved a large number of times in my you know, earliest years. Mm-hmm. And then we kind of settled down in, uh, in the area of San Antonio and in Texas Hill Country, but still moved quite a few times. Yeah. Four times. Yeah. And you know, then I went to college, then I went to law school, and then I moved to San Diego. Yeah. And I've been here for a long time, but I just noticed that there's like something about this particular place or about me in this place where uh, I have relationships, but not deep roots. Like the soil just doesn't seem to have a lot of uh, yeah. roots in it, or at least again, for me, right? It may just yeah. be that there was something about the place that had a, a role to play in my life, but that role wasn't deep roots. Yeah. yeah. And so... You know, even just the contemplation of, hey, if we're going to be moving somewhere full yeah. time, literally yeah. relocate, what does yeah. that imply? What's the feeling of that? What's that imply for the shift? Yeah. And I was like, hmm, you know, there's some number of people that I'll want to say bye to. And, yeah. um, and that's kind of it. You know? Yeah. Maybe go around to a few places and just remember the life stages and transitions that were occur that you know, happen in each one of those. We're talking about more than two decades. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of that, right? So it's definitely landing that, to, that, that this next place, hopefully, fingers crossed, although you never know, mm-hmm. um, might very well be the last place that I end up. I don't know if this is you know, getting to the mm-hmm. point where moving to more places has higher and higher, yeah. um, just cost, but like the energy for moving, it just isn't there. Yeah. Um, and, and, also, when you think of, and when you think of age as the energy to the, the mass energy ratios shifting right that becomes shifting more and more important <laughs> yeah. Yeah. a lot and then as as you know as i imagine um you know i've mm-hmm. got a, a little one mm-hmm. and a really high degree of uh hope that she'll have continuity of context and that she will have a place where she meets friends at a young age and keeps those friends for a long period of time and she has places and she feels and the place is amenable to deep roots like it's a place that's appropriate and wants to have like ohana which is the you know, family right. hawaiian extended right. family right um which then of course would imply that for her I, I would endeavor to be the next place i go for some long period of time call it you know 15 20 years mm-hmm. and, you know that's pretty much the end of my story so um, yeah certainly in terms of relocating willy-nilly yeah so that's the yeah that feeling is is pretty strong and pretty real right yeah it's funny because i we've talked about this before but my i mean i grew up in in chicago till i was 12 in the in that area and my grandparents my my grandfather moved he was um he apprenticed as a tailor once he escaped from um, his, his, his 17, uh, brothers and sisters, family on the farm, he escaped from that <laughs> and found a, t- a tailor in Hanover, Germany to apprentice with. And then I don't know if any of these, like, I, I still to this day, don't know which of these, these stories are actually true, <laughs> hmm. but there, but there, he says, like, we, I came, I came to, I, I went on the boat and they put me at the bottom of the boat. And then I went to America with 50 cents in my pocket. And he started Hoff Cleaners. His last name was Hoffmeister. And that existed all the way up until, I think, 10 years ago. Um, mm. And we, it, it was this experience of, you know, he, he found it with my grandmother, with my grandmother. His son bought it. Then my mom bought it from her brother, right? And it, and and, and the aunt, um, my uncle Ted and aunt Diane and my grandfather and grandma lived like two doors down for years. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there is a, there is a sense in which, and I would, you know, my, my, both my parents, it was, it was a strange dichotomy because both my parents were, um, addicts and alcoholics and, you know, nutty and crazy, but my grandparents really open to me. And so I would spend a lot of time over there. Um, and, and the experience of going to my grandfather's, it has such, it had such a sense of 
place, mm -hmm. right? And and it's funny because you know it's like a whole world. It's like that the, my imagination just just plugged right in there, and I could just go into be by myself and like just create worlds right in my mind and climb trees and you know we he had he had geese that he used to like you know have chase me around and he'd take pictures of me <laughs> with them biting me um and i remember i remember when we moved and it was probably one of the most and i've, I've only come to appreciate this as i've gotten older more and more i pre I, like appreciate it more as i get older but when we were 12 and my parents got sober, um, they realized they could stay sober in Chicago. So we, we, we moved from Chicago to a place called Cottonwood, Arizona, which is hmm. 20 minutes away from um, Sedona. And basically- North went, or south? Uh, south. Closer to Flagstaff? Yeah. Closer to, so, um, closer to Flagstaff. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And- um, Oh, no, no, closer to Phoenix, so south. So the Verde Valley, right? There's Got Jerome, it. right, and, and down there. And we, so we moved from basically, you know, they, they, um, they actually kind of snorted the, the family business up their nose, <laughs> right? And, and mm. uh, went from kind of middle, upper class -y kind of scenario to single white trailer in Cottonwood, Arizona, right? And it was... And it's funny because that shift was basically moving away from my grandparents. And, yeah. and, and I think, and it wasn't just my grandparents. And I've come to kind of, I, 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 I'm coming to appreciate the degree in which it was that my pet grandparents fostered a place, like a, a gathering history, if you will. It's like everything about it made it what it was and kind of grew out of it and mirrored it back and formed it. It was like a dwelling in some sense. And I'm so I, I, um, I really noticed in just this last bit, um, because I've actually been specifically going back to places mm -hmm. where I spent meaningful time, like where I, okay, this is a place where these things happened. Yeah. And the thing that was quite clear is that the land holds memory. And I, and yeah. I think it's like, super powerful, not just a little bit, like not like, oh, because I'm here, I'm reminded, but no land holds memory. There's something about the way that the human and the place relate that memory lives sort of distributed between the two. Right. Um, and so if you don't have land that has place, if you don't have place, then you also don't have memory in a meaningful right. sense, like a very important sense. Right. Um, and there's a whole, this is like the uh, like if you take this this chunk and you kind of rotate it and just sort of let it move. Yeah, um, it's connected to a lot of other things. Oh God, so many other things. Yeah, so many other things. I mean, if he it also if we if we look at place because place is it, it just as a as a distinction, right? Is it's not space, right? It's something else. Like when you really like think about, or when I think about place, it's got a, like a, it's got a, like a, some, a, a topological verticality, right? There's a, there's something about, you can't, you, you know, you go to a place and you try to point to where the place is. Mm. You can't. So what is that that we're related to when we say we're in a place? Right. Well, so we could flip it too, because you know, where I've something I've really noticed here is where we we moved when we decided that we were going to have a kid. We moved from the place that we had been um, for about four years, and we moved to a place that's um, not too far away, but sort of a Southern California suburban, um, with the, actually a very nice house with a little backyard, and we can see the beach and the, the ocean off in the distance. Quite beautiful, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the interesting characteristics is I've now lived here for more than three years. I have a dog and a kid, which means I'm outside in the front, particularly walking around on the block into the, there's a park like two blocks away a lot, like, you know, four or five times a week. Yeah. And yeah. I've met, like encountered one, 
two, three, four, five neighbors. Mm-hmm. And I know the names of one. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm actually, yeah. I'm, I'm sort of affirmatively choosing to be a little bit friendly. Like I'll actually cross the street and introduce myself to make, mm-hmm. to make, to, to make contact. And, you know, so I walk and there's a, on the one hand, this place, but this is, you know, a walk that we'll take at night, you know, we'll look at the stars, we'll listen and we can kind of see the flickering of TVs inside people's houses. I'm familiar with the houses, but there's no place. There's something yeah. about the lack of relationship, the lack of humanness, the lack of community. Yeah. It's yeah. also, you know, it's kind of the inverse. You know, if you don't have place, you don't have memory. Well, if you don't have relationship, you don't have place. Like there's these yeah. things all kind of connect together. Yeah. Yeah. So not yeah. St- exclusively, not exclusively. Mm-hmm. I remember uh, just this last week I went to a, uh, there's a Canyon near where, God, this house, the first house I had here, like I moved from an apartment for the first time I moved to a house and mm-hmm. the house was on a Canyon close to a Canyon. And every morning for like a decade, I would wake up before sunrise and go for a walk in this Canyon with my dog mm-hmm. and watch the sunrise over the Canyon. Not every mm-hmm. morning, but a lot. Mm-hmm. So that was by myself, mm-hmm. but it was a place. Yeah. So yeah. there's something like soulfulness that maybe is a better thing than just relationship. Yeah. What is that? What is, if you look at that example, what is it that made it a place? Hmm. Well, the thing that came into my mind is, um, you know, one of, one of the, one of the models I've been using in the context of Sibium yeah. is there's like, and this didn't actually come from Forrest, but there's a lot of, of uh, just because of the time I've spent with him, I end up having a lot of similarities, but there's like three different modes of relating to the notion of the, of the sacred in general. Mm. And yeah. um, one mode, which is, is not very commonly perceived. Well, maybe it is, maybe it's more commonly perceived than I, than I know of what I might call like the convivial mode. So this is like the, you know, gathering at Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. Um, anything that sort of involves relationality, mm-hmm. but also like chop wood, carry water, like the yeah. planting of a plant and watching it grow, right. um, harvesting, cooking, you know, things having to do with livingness, mm-hmm. um, that, that mode, which would map in many ways to the imminent mode in, in forest language, if you're at all familiar with it. Yeah. Now the more common mode, the mode that's more, you know, typically in the West and mostly, frankly, most of the world associated with the sacred would be, Mm, the mode of kind of the, the pure transcendent, right? So this might be, you know, watching the sunrise in Sedona uh, mm-hmm. or the awesome, yeah. like the awesome landscape, like yeah. the Grand Canyon or a thunderstorm, or yeah. of course the human built awesome, like a cathedral or a, right. you know, a, a Beethoven's ninth symphony, things like that, that have like yeah. a sense of, of ecstasy and exit and transcendence, yeah. right? So one right. is actually coming into life more fully right. grounding right. in the aspects of yeah. life into the, call it the mundane, but now the mundane latent or potent with meaning. And the other movement is a movement out, uh, out of the, of the body and kind of into the uh-huh. aspects of the transcendent. Yeah. And both I think are relate, ways of relating to the, to the sacred. Hmm. And then the third is art, artistic, the, the creation, the actual pulling into reality, the, the absolutely new. You know, for the very first, the zero to one, you know, the, the creative principle, finding ways to tune into the creative principle and then embodiment, bringing that mm-hmm. out of in some sense, the relationship coming and bringing it out of yeah. the transcendent into livingness. Yeah. You know, so birth, childbirth, yeah. you know, that's a great example of that, where it's you know, this, this cycle of motion of like the bringing new life into the world. And then like the little, the moment after childbirth, when the child is now nursing is a movement yeah. into the living. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, totally. And, you know, in some sense, I would say that it's uh, to the degree to which the sacred is present through any or all of those modes, you now have this binding that we would call place and memory. Like that's the thing. Mm-hmm. And to the degree to which it's profane, meaning that you're just sort of like you're existing as opposed yeah. to living, yeah. then it's not. Yeah. 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 And I think that's a lot of what's bundled up, right? And that's very much at the heart of, of, of the civium is, hey, can we, can we remember that we're here to live, not to merely survive. And right. there's a, a way of being that's, you know, uh, uh, moving away from the super salient into the relevant and to make mm-hmm. it a little bit less uh, poetic. Mm-hmm. Every move, so many moves of the past, gosh, maybe the whole, you know, the whole modern 
Enlightenment project. Right? Everything about capitalism have, has a characteristic of a movement towards the salient. Yeah, you know, we can get an abundance, or let's say a plenty of the salient. Yeah, but it comes a little bit as a at a cost mm-hmm. of the relevant, of the grounded, of the of the sacred. Yeah. And this may actually be a very poor trade. Yeah, this is um something to take it a little bit more in the global sense of this. There's a flaw. I can't remember his name. He's He's um, I don't know, he's a continental philosopher. He's uh, has a whole political like theory, and it's he brings up this really interesting point where he said that you know when it was the U.S. and USSR, right? Neoliberalism, right, had a place with centralized in America. Right, symbolically, man, for a lot of t- like, practically, like literally and practically, and the USSR had a place, right? But when essentially commu- communism fell, what he says is that then the the one game in town, neoliberalism no longer at a place. And he said that because, because there was, it was, it lost its competition, it became mm. the norm, but because it became the norm, it lost, it became everywhere. And you can kind of see this, you know, go to Zimbabwe or something and there's a McDonald's that so there is a kind of uniformity of everywhere starting to look like everywhere else or that phenomena. Um, and so I actually have a sense. It, it, I think that's a really good. I think it's a really good argument, right? In the sense of my growing sense of of what's going on here, in some way, is that it is become more and more the case that, like in San Diego, or especially like in Phoenix, right, or these 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 newer cities, right, which are based on the kind of the grid. Um, freeway system versus, you know, the older cities that were based on the railroad system where everything converged, right? And you can literally see histories of time, right? Getting like intermixing and complexifying, right? Mm -hmm. These newer cities, that sense of living somewhere, like you're talking about San Diego, where you could live there for five years and you just don't know, you know, one person. Right. And you walk around, but there's nothing that totally gathers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That totally gathers in that sense. Right. Well, it's funny because the, you know, we have the term to kind of use the the notion of cars, for example, we have a concept of human scale design, Mm -hmm. which is a funny term. Yeah. It it implies the inhuman (laughs) as the, you know, to, to consciously have to actually work to do something which is human scale. Yeah. And that doesn't necessarily mean just size, right? All kinds yeah. of characteristics implies that there's a necessity and need to consciously return or move away from kind of a default mode of the inhuman, <laughs> mm-hmm. which is a very odd thing. Like how, how could we even find ourselves at all attracted to the inhuman? And of course the point is, is precisely the point is that it's just unconscious as you know, to the degree to which you are operating in a mode that is unconscious, then the, um, hmm, how would this be, be kind of the, 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 all right, let me, let me put together a little quick little toolkit. This is a very old toolkit of mine, but it's a quite useful one. So you have the evolutionary faculties, uh, the, the, the faculties of, of choice making that de- were derived through an evolutionary process. And, you know, so I've got a, a sensing that a, a sugar, for example, a classic example, is a highly attractive and highly motivating as any young child, any parent of a young child knows. Candy is magic. Um, and from a, you know, long arc of evolutionary history, as every horse knows, that's a wise choice. Right? Calories are hard to come by. Starvation is, you know, relatively common, and so yeah. dense, dense calories is a is a. If you go after dense calories to consume when you can, you're going to survive. 
and those yep. that don't don't survive as much, right? So there's a the evolutionary sense making choice making architecture has a set of, of, of values that it uses uh-huh. and heuristics that it uses to navigate. Right now, enter humanity, and one of the characteristics of humanity is niche construction through the wazoo and right? our ability yep. to actually change our environment to suit our own preferences mm-hmm. um, means that we have the ability to upregulate or, or increase, concentrate the presencing of what it is we choose. Yep. But now we have a problem because mm-hmm. our evolutionary algorithmic system wasn't designed around that capacity. It was designed mm-hmm. around the capacity of receiving possibility, not creating possibility. Yeah. So what do we end up huh. doing? We end up upregulating the salient. We, we generate more. Wait, sure. can, can we go back That's, to that? I just sure. want to go back to that thing you just said. So can you just uh, double click on that a little bit more? The, the, the receiving possibility versus creating possibility. Sure. I mean, just think yeah. about the, the simple, the simple movement of like a, um, like to go with an herbivore or, or a predator, mm-hmm. right? The, the herbivore searches for food, mm. right? not create food. Yeah. If, if, it, if it does not have food, it goes elsewhere to look for it. Right? Uh-huh. So it receives food if food is present. And if it isn't, it's only valid strategies to go elsewhere. Right? So yeah. search, literally just search is the mode, right? Predator yeah. does more than more, more or less the same thing. A yeah. predator lays in wait or hunts, but there's a process of if there's food, it gets it. And if there's no food, it doesn't. But the notion of changing the environment to actually cause the thing that you're seeking to be yeah. there yeah. is a very different kind of thing. Now, yeah, this is not un- entirely unique to humans, as we yeah. know, like there's ants taking aphids and putting them in locations is a, is a thing. Mm-hmm. So niche construction is very much a thing, but humans take niche construction way, way out. Yeah, yeah. And, and so we have the ability to give ourselves what we want. And now we yeah. run into a challenge, which is that the linkage between the relevance realization aspect, yeah. which is something like the, the actual fitness function bound directly to evolutionary fitness, the sensing system that is trying to uh, embody that relevance in concrete choices. Yeah. And then the actual actuation system, which realizes those choices in actual choices, you know, is, is as loosely coupled as evolution was able to put it together, which is pretty loosely coupled. Right? Yeah. So the, the, promise, the premise of um, the body is dehydrated. The body needs a, an influx of H2O in order to be able to effectuate a variety of metabolic needs. That's way down at the bottom of the metabolic stack. Mm-hmm. Right. Then there's a sensing of, I feel thirsty and right? a super complex integration of of biological met- metrics, like a, 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 the a, a below threshold lack of certain, you know, not enough H2O molecules in the system, getting that signal through a wide variety of very distinct means is integrated into a sensorium that comes up with the feeling of thirsty. I am yeah. just feeling thirsty. Right, right. Whatever it is, like lots of stuff. A dry mouth does not mean thirsty. Thirsty is a whole body system need yeah. more water. Parts. Yeah integration. It's an integrative move, but then I'm going to go get a drink of Coke, right? So now I have that. How do I actuate this feeling? I have a, mm-hmm. a value become mm-hmm. hydrated, but then I have a gap between how I, what it is that I need and what it is that I manifest as my want. Mm-hmm. And that, that coupling is, is, is not very good. Um, Cause broadly speaking, the coupling was driven by just straight, you know, physical reality created by boundary conditions. Water yeah. was what you drank. <laughs> Done. <Yeah. laughs> Thirsty drink water. That's it. There wasn't yeah. a lot of options. Um, so when we find ourselves in a circumstance where we can we can massively, massively overcode our choice making ability to actually generate choices that are truly healthy, effective yeah. choices. Yeah. And we can give ourselves what we want like crazy, but yeah. at the cost of actually getting in the way of what we need. Right. Um, and so you know, that 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 process right there, that little kind of that little kind of pr- yeah. problem generates a whole universe of cascade effects. Right. Um, like all, like it st- strikes me as all of the humanly created systems that then create us, basically. Right. 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 And throws us just way, like way off our our, our equilibrium. Yeah. yeah. And, and so one of the, so what I would say is it's something like my kind of rewinding the clock. 
in our conversation, it's something like there's actually a primary move, which is a little bit like the, the extraction of the natural into the salient, yep. which is sort of the real thing that's happening. And then in the context of, of capitalism or neoliberalism and, and what would we call global socialism kind of competing, yeah. Yeah. Because they were competing, there was actually like a tension up here that actually yeah. prevented the vertical extraction move on either side from yeah. going super normal. Yeah. You know, either one would have had a similar, and then we know like in any location where one tended to dominate, it had its yeah. own version of the yeah. uh, dehumanization of or the denationalization, yeah. the relevancization, the devitalization of life. Yeah. And so then in the story, I would say is that when one finally went away, yeah. the other one was sort of able to run uh, unobstructed, but its primary move was this move of, you know, an unconscious process, a fundamental process of just kind of stumbling around using our evolved sense-making and choice-making systems, which were increasingly ill-suited to the actual landscape that we were confronted with, which is in fact the, the landscape that we were beginning, that we had produced ourselves. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. that's, you know, that's a, and, and you can just take that, that problem and yeah. run up and down. You know, we don't yeah. have any clue how to deal with superhuman AI. Right. Right. The unconscious process will definitely make bad choices. And how do we deal with superhuman AI? Right. We also don't know how to build like inhuman, you know, if we stumble our way into inhuman scale because, you know, the small, I, oh gosh, walking to the store, which we've all, we've been doing now for, ever literally you know all the way back to the beginning of, of by ambulatory beings at all mm-hmm. is kind of a bummer i'd like to not walk cool this guy's got a car car's a lot yeah. cooler right the ability to extrapolate out well now that i can drive to the store i have to park the car and i have a driveway and, and now people are going to be able to you know the, that opportunity of being able to move further away with the car but that you know all the con- the downstream consequences of this hyper complex system yeah um way outside the scale of what our evolved choice making sense making environment could make puts us more and more into a kind of an unfolding catastrophe of our own making just kind of like stumbling forward in every choice we make because it's coming using the wrong underlying choice making basis to make good choices in this context just makes things worse right we just sort of like ah yeah falling all over the place yeah uh, and so the answer of course is it has to move into consciousness we yeah. have to move into be okay. Fuck. <laughs> right. If we're, if we're making choices on the basis of evolved, received, you know, yeah. algorithmic, unconscious heuristics, yeah, we're just going to keep fucking it up. Like we right. need to figure out how to build an entirely new approach to this. And yeah, yeah that's the in many ways the originary insight that led me on this part of my life journey for the past fifteen years. Huh. Huh. When did you have that insight? Uh, well, actually, was I had it, the insight for the was first it, time. I... Was, it a, was it an insight that was like flash a light? Yeah, yeah, insight, flashlight. Um, the first time it landed actually was my junior year of college. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the second time was actually much more of a... Uh, verbalizable like the second time was in a period between like 2005 and 2008 mm-hmm. where I again if I had moved to a place where I was in a position to start like really gathering um conceptual structures and vocabulary yeah. and language and you know being able to sort of embody the insight in a in a form is that when you started beginning. was that when you started reading like Deleuze and no, I started reading Deleuze in 1991. Oh, okay. Okay. But it took me a decade to get to the point where it was anything more. I mean, think about that. It's, by the way, just an FYI. Like I so said, for at least a decade, I was reading Deleuze a lot. Yeah. And I had I had no idea what it was. Like, I couldn't, yeah. couldn't make any sense of it. But nonetheless, yeah. I was reading it. Like, I was reading it, going yeah. back, reading. And it was a very interesting process of... Yeah. Um, like basically in some sense, teaching myself French without yeah. any other reference, like nobody knew, nobody pointing to the bread and saying, this is uh, you know, yeah. whatever fucking bread is in French. Pong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, literally just having to do the, okay, there's some sense going on in here. Right. I don't, I, don't, I know it's deep and intense and powerful and I'm just going to just kind of keep imbibing it and like almost like absorbing the, the, 
like the invisible architectures that are holding things together. Yeah. And just, just like continuing to refine them. And then eventually other pieces came together to cause it to kind of be a cascade right. effect. So around, around 2005 in particular was when Delonda, um, you know, probably 2003, maybe was when I started really getting into Delonda. Yeah. And Delonda's stuff, either because of just the nature of how he did his thing or where I was in my life, it was a, uh, you know, I, I'm not that familiar with Delonda. Is he a, is he an uh, author or like philosopher? Yeah, he's um, I'd say he's a philosopher. Okay, you know, just put gotcha. him there in that category. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd say he's maybe like in some sense the philosopher of Gen X, but he's he's from Mexico City. Okay, so he doesn't really have. I mean, he taught in New York, but yeah. I think he's global and even European okay. Okay. energy. Um, at least that's my feeling of him. Yeah, and he was extremely influenced by Deleuze. Yeah, but or his first few few books were his books. And then he would kind of like at the end, like a little, little comment, here's some stuff from Deleuze mm-hmm. that I was thinking about. Mm-hmm. So a beautiful way to actually get a very different. So instead of somebody who was quite explicitly, you know, a Deleuze scholar, mm-hmm. he was sort of Delanda doing his own fucking thing, influenced yeah. by Deleuze and some stuff about Deleuze that I was using. And suddenly like, it's like the Rosetta fucking stone. Like, whoa, oh. okay, shit. <laughs> All the pieces yeah. start coming together very, very yeah. rap. Well, not very rapid, but over like a three-year time frame. Yeah. That so and it's same, by the way, the same moment where complex system science was also available. So both right. of those were able to be absorbed simultaneously. So that's the so that experience, I just want to go back a little bit more of that when you started. So I, I, I this is a this is such a mystery to me. Um, but there's a lot, there's a lot to understanding this, I think. There's a lot in here. But when you were reading Deleuze and you were re- basically reading a language that no one else really spoke, <laughs> right? Like, what, what were you hearing? What was, of all the things that you could be doing, your attention was, there, <laughs> right? Like, you had no basis to understand what you were reading, right? Yet you were able to understand that there was something there that by definition you couldn't understand that whatever that, whatever you were responding to and whatever it is that responds to things like that in that way. Yeah. That, that piece, that last part. What is that? that? Well, yeah. yeah. Well, okay. Let me put this out there. Mm-hmm. So let's say you imagine a, uh, an artist, uh, one of the pops to my mind is maybe Picasso with Guernica, but there's many, many others. Mm-hmm. And it is, I, I've learned, I, I don't really, I'm not an artist in that sense, even vaguely, like even mm-hmm. a tiny bit, mm-hmm. uh, but I have learned in conversations that you know, it's very much not that Picasso is sitting there and kind of like imagining the season image of Guernica in his head. He's like, Oh yeah, I'm going to draw that. Yeah. It's not that. Yeah. Even like not even, not even a little bit like that. Apparently, um, one of the guys, it's not Alex Gray, but one of the other guys kind of like that, uh, Android Jones yeah. doesn't even have visual imagination at all. So he can't picture like a circle in his visual mind. Mm-hmm. So he's drawing this extremely complex, psychedelic, you know, mm-hmm. giant paintings mm-hmm. and isn't seeing them at all. Like he's, his commentary is like, look, I see it for the first time when you see it for the first yeah. time. Like I yes. look at it and go, oh, that's it, right? So you can also modify it like to the musician. You know, you're, you're sitting there and you're playing like, you know, my cl- my example of the jazz musician, but now the jazz musician is playing and they're, and they're playing with, there's no script. They're just playing. And so there's a feeling, a feeling of what is that which wants to be or is appropriate or the natural or the right or the, you know, pick your term, whatever the term is right. that is in the direction of yes, right? Funny, right. you have to get like way out of words into simple like sensibilities of, you know, yes, Yes. Uh, yesness. Um, and, and very complex, very connected, by the way, to that, that previous conversation on that notion of, of uh, thirsty. And right? it's a highly subtle integration of a diversity of elements that are by definition unnameable. But if you build a sensitivity to it, you can begin to integrate it into a feeling. And that feeling you can now name as, ah, thirsty. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. So, so a feeling, right? A feeling of there's like this immense immensity and there's and there's something both powerful and beautiful and subtle in this immensity and the feeling is hyper vague 
like way out there vague, but just strong enough to say, you know, keep going. Like it, 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 it can give birth. It can be born in this inside you. If you continue to just sort of allow and go. Yeah. yeah. And um, I think that's, like you right. run across those di- different metaphors. Right. Right. Um, and I think, by the way, very simple ones, well, not simple ones, is, that's, that's, that's not uh, appropriate, but like, you know, you're, you're imagining the taste of the soup, like, hmm, needs a bit more salt without tasting it. Like, yeah. hmm, I think you taste it in that, in that ability to discern a little more salt, like that, that notion yeah. of discernment, that ability yeah. to sort of sense something. Yeah. What is it that moves it more in the direction of yes? Yeah. So there's a recognition, there's something that you recognize, but what's so interesting about this is that there's, and that what you're talking about is that there's a recognition of, wait a minute, there's some faint sense of intelligibility. You recognize it somehow, but especially in what you're talking about with somebody like Deleuze and these kinds of things, right? You're, it's, it's, it's a recognition, but yet it's what, what you recognize is not at all determined but it draws you in. There's something yeah. about the, you know, let me, um, let me read something. Uh, Ponte's, I had this, you know, I, I'm always having these crazy text exchanges with John. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the other day we got into one and he was talking about, oh, well, I can just, uh, rather than looking for it. Oh, there it is. There we go. This, this, em, this embodied felt sense of perception, right? And how one comes to recognize something. Um, so listen to the way that Ponty talks about um, facing another. So here's a, here's a quote from him. I am drawn towards this face as taking, as taking up again something recognized. I'm drawn towards this face as taking up again something recognized that is in the process of coming to expression between us. It, it is at first an unclear beckoning, but mm. one that is felt it is, a, it is at first an unclear beckoning, but one that is felt. My body leans towards the person receptively, right? Mm. Mm-hmm. So, so in, in some sense, right, this is, and especially now with Teague, my, my, my son born, it's so, it is so standing out to me more than ever um, this time around, this, <laughs> this, <laughs> this sense of um, holding. I realized somebody, uh, Chris texted me the other day. He said, like, how's Teague? And I went to go answer. And I thought, I just noticed my picturing of him. And in every mm-hmm. picture I had of him, there was no Teague. There was Teague being held. Hmm. Right, Teague being held in every single, and if it if it's not literally held, it's held in our attention, held in blankets. Like, in fact, if we lose track of him for like five seconds, it's like there's a <laughs> there's a big break. Right, yeah. this sense of this sense of holding, and this face to face relation, and in some sense, when that holding works, and he's not shitting, or he's done shitting and he's fed, and he's napped, and it's almost as if all of that was for these moments where he goes, and he looks out. And it is, I swear to God, you could have the most satanic, like evil, um, mean person walking by, right? And he would be defenseless and just kind of being drawn into this we recognize something. I think what we're looking at is in some sense, the very beginnings of recognition of this looking out. There's something that we understand in that drawing in, right? Did did I, 
well, it doesn't matter because I'm going to have to recapitulate the effect of the whole thing. So if I'm saying it again, I apologize, but Please. it's considered to be a reminder. I probably need to hear it again anyways. One, one of the practices that I felt really good about that we did with uh, our little one was um, a little bit like mutual discernment training. Mm. So the, the rule was, uh, in particular, specific in this context of holding, um, never hold her or move her without her consent. Right? Mm. So like, let's say, mm. let's say she's currently being held by mom. Yeah. And the notion that maybe I'll hold her for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. an invitation right? so literally just standing with hands open in kind of a holding orientation right for a period of time like to, yeah. to wait and just wait and give yeah. time you know really allow the body of the of the baby to perceive right you know, and then see if that if see if that perception leads up to some kind of response yeah and yeah. you know in many cases it doesn't but in some cases it does in some cases it's a perceptible pulling away yeah no <laughs> yeah. In some cases, we're going towards yes. Yeah. Very simple, noticing yesness, and that's a you know, it's collaboration. Right? It's on yeah. on the part of in this case me to perceive the signal to figure out how do I communicate and how do I perceive, mm -hmm. and of course her, you know, her whole system beginning yeah. to learn how to perceive what is being offered in reality, then perceive its own interior yesness and noness, and then to express that in some fashion, which of course is in many ways the big learning. Yeah. Um, what we discovered was that it didn't take long. We're talking days, certainly by weeks hmm. uh, before there was a, an obvious an increasingly like a clear signal, the perception, like this signal was mapped to something in a very subtle <laughs> complex way. And that there was that. a beginning of a building out of a way to communicate, you know, first communication uh, in that, you know, exterior, interior, interior, exterior dynamic. Right. Um, and of course, this gives rise to the, the, the thesis, which seems yeah. to have been borne out now almost three years into the experimental protocol is um, that's the foundation, right? You know, how yeah. do you, how does a being, how does a human know yeah. how to listen to their own interior? Yeah. How do they learn how to perceive and how do they learn how to express? Right. Oh. we'll uh, have to figure out how to do something with the recording because we have a commitment not to put her on social media. You got it. I can edit that out. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It was so uh, powerful. It'd be fun to imagine like doing some kind of like a uh, blur out, but because I think the scene was quite good, but yeah, there's so much that went on right in that moment. Yeah. 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 Especially in what we were talking about, I could just having just talked about what you just talked about, this coversing, right? This feeling into is like, do you want to be held? Do I have permission? This I just the sense that as you're talking about that was feeling into what what in me would do that and what I'm doing when I'm doing that right is the there's something very very fractal about the whole thing right and then and then having her then just come on having that right there and then watching her just do these whatever it was that she was doing. Yeah. Like I was like, oh yeah, I could, I could, I could watch that for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's nice also how there's such an invitation to slowing down. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. And as it turns out, a return then to the critique, the concern with a, a culture that doesn't mm -hmm. create that space. Yeah. Culture almost defined by too much. Yep. Yep. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. What was the phrase? I got to tell you, man, this, um, we learned the hard way. 
I get the feeling that we're heading pretty rapidly towards the end of a big learning and well, the, the beginning of a big learning, <laughs> the end of the not yet learning and to the beginning of the, oh, <laughs> learning, um, which will resolve itself in a tremendous, tremendous simplification or slowing down uh, in comparison with the qualities of life that we currently are bombarded by. Um, yeah. I'm not quite sure how we get from here to there, um, but it seems like that's just the direction it's going to, it must take, like to put it quite concretely. Yeah. 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 The sense of, it's a whisper. It's a whisper, yeah. Whisper is, mm -hmm. whisper is really an interesting thing to think about, right? Because I'm speaking, but I am intentionally not using my voice. So I'm whispering. Mm -hmm. there's, this, there's this beautiful ambiguity in that, right? Mm. Yeah, and the other side is the um, the hearing of the whisper. Yeah, the yeah. perceptual side of it, the, the expressive side, and the perceptive side. The, yeah, you're walking, and you don't you mm, would that be like the minimum viable here? Yeah. You don't even yeah. know that you heard anything, but you know you heard that something was heard, something like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Like that, and yeah. your attention shifts, like something that pulls your attention, but you don't even have. Yeah. Hmm. You pay yeah. more attention. Yeah. In a minute. Yeah. That's what I was thinking about. I mean, I would imagine reading Deleuze. In some sense, you heard a whisper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Inside in and in in in, it's funny as kind of rewinding it because there's there's iterations, yeah. I mean, so many iterations. In my, in my case, it was something like um, so first there was a girl, as there often is in these cases, mm -hmm. and she just sort of put in front of me this this notion of Nietzsche. So I just in a context where the it was like was an acceptation. There was a very salient energy girl, um, which then the whisper is this particular girl out of all girls attend to. Why does her orientation towards Nietzsche carry more energy? No, no, but it does. Okay. Yeah. So therefore that energy kind of that's pulls you in, but there's something there, right? You read your Nietzsche, you're like, it's not, it's not empty. There's something there. Yeah. And it's interesting because it, it invites or pulls towards hearing more subtly. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. I'm kind of learning how to hear a whisper. Yeah. And it was actually through, it was actually in the context of Nietzsche that I found Deleuze. I was reading his book on Nietzsche. And what I noticed was it was the only one that I had read of all the kind of secondary commentaries. Like it was Jung's was good, but Deleuze's was much better. It was like yeah. a vector. Yeah. Mm, there's something here that, com that, oh, yeah. that resonates or harmonizes right. with my own felt sense of the subtlety that's behind the obvious right. more deeply. Right. So it's like we were both listening to a similar whisper. And because of that, I could now begin to hear this yeah. one. Yeah. Hmm, there's something there. So there it's like go. these layers and, and sort of stages and layers and stages and layers and stages yeah. and cultivation of an increasingly sort of, what would it be like a, a confidence or what's the phrase? I use this, like when I, when I transitioned to my forties, one of the things that I noticed was that I was, much more stable in just listening to my intuitions because yeah. I'd had enough life experience to just know what it felt yeah. like when something was likely going to be the way it was going to be. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Easier, much, much yeah. easier. Like I didn't have to obsess around thinking or analyzing. Yeah. You're like, yeah, that's how, this is more or less how it's going to be. Yeah. I can just listen to that. And that guy yeah. can guide choices increasingly skillfully. Yeah. 
It's a deep sensibility. Mm -hmm. It's also kind of this sense in which um, there's there's the there's the what is it to what is it to to hear a secret or listen a whisper right because um, there is something that like a secret I see if I can if I can put this in the words it's like it's like right at the edges <laughs> um, hopefully we don't fall down like mm -hmm. a secret. To hear a secret, in some sense, if you tell me what the secret is, you haven't told me a secret, hmm. right? Like there's this way where if you disclose a secret, you you no longer it's no longer a secret. Thus, you never hear a secret. So there's something about a kind of listening and speaking, I would imagine, that. Re Here's the secret in such a way that restores it to the keeping of the secret, right? Like, like to hear something like to hear the, to let, to let what is heard mingle um, undefined and even, even let it to restore its keeping to the undefinable, right? Yeah. The, the way it's coming up for me is that it's, um, what ends up happening is that the polarity reverses that it's not like the secret comes to you, but rather you come to it. You, you become yeah. one who is a holder of yeah. like you come with me into the space. It's, it's actually not that I exit the secret out of the vault and bring it to you in the sunlight, but yeah. rather that I invite you into the dark. Right. And now you're one in the dark along with me. And now we're sharing in this space and in this space. We can kind of can, can the secret together. Yeah. Uh, but there is no, there's no movement of it out. Yeah. They lost like the notion, like the Eleusinian mysteries are a mystery cult. Yeah. Very similar, right? You don't, yeah. you don't learn the mystery. You become, what is the word? Indoctrinated? No more. Right. Initiated. Initiated, right. You become yeah. initiated. Yeah. Yes. And in some sense, there's, um, mm -hmm. Again, in this same thread is 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 Marisol Ponte, and and kind of gathering this sense of recognition that symbolically, in a genuine encounter, right, where an encounter has a quality of these two things coming together, where you have there's a recognition, yet the recognition is simultaneously with the drawing in for what is undisclosed, yet a leaning in drawing into what you can you can recognize but is on is yet determined yet there's a quality of just like when a recognition of the face of the other i recognize something i i see your face and then i'm drawn in right such that it unf what you unfold or the process unfolds between us in that recognition and this way that how do we come to recognize something at all, right? And like threading this back to Ponte, later on, he goes into the child's experience of grokking color, right? Of how, he, how, they, how, how a child comes to, to see color as color, right? Is that is that it's 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 actually how that happens is that it's not it's not that the child right because he because you get in these epistemological riddles that are unsolvable if you stay kind of in the epistemology part of it hmm. but if there's an and, and this kind of goes back to what john in some sense is, is central to his work right which is this notion of knowledge as conformity with reality Right. Mm. And specifically in the, in, in when the child learns to recognize color, he describes that it's not that they identify color, that then they can then come and recognize it. There is a reconfiguration of the structure of consciousness, right. That affords, right. Colors to, to, to speak. 
that's like yeah. a recognition, right? Yep. And then yep. you like then they can lean in. And what's interesting is that then afterwards the child thinks back to before that moment, and they remember seeing color the whole time, right? Like even the memories, right? When they actually didn't recognize color in their memories, but when they go to remember it from this reconfiguration, it they it updates the color. So those mm-hmm. those kind of moments of recognizing. Well, I mean, yeah. the, the thing that that kind of pops hard in the foreground for me there is just some of these notions, like the notion of the structure of consciousness. Yeah. And uh, the various processes by which that structure is structured. Yeah. And that's a, that's a like that little block right there. Yeah. Pretty intense block. Right. And that, yeah. as far as I know, none of that's obvious. <laughs> I don't oh. know anybody who's like, that is how it works. Or even yeah. that, right? Think about yeah. it. It's sort of reasonably controversial that that is yeah. a valid set proposition that has a referent in reality. Yeah. Um, and it's super interesting to even, okay, let's assume that it has a referent. What's, what's going on there? But as you're yeah. saying it, um, it feels like it's exactly right. Like mm-hmm. that notion that there's a mm-hmm. shape or structure, mm-hmm. consciousness. So I see, I actually see like a, a sphere, um, a little bit like um, like a blob floating, like a lava lamp sphere, mm-hmm. and then you know a little pseudopod comes out yeah and and that now is a different capacity for whatever we want to call it cognition or recognition something like that like some way of um quality hmm, like the hmm, like the most foundational or fundamental or subtle embodiment of quality in the context of something as hyper abstract as the geometry of consciousness, something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that is definitely, if I'm just, as I'm saying, like, that's my experience, broadly speaking. Right? My experience yeah. is one of like, it's very kinetic or kinesthetic. There's yeah. some sort of conformity. There's some shape. The, the metaphor of shape is a very good metaphor. Yeah. And there's like, almost like feeling the shape when the shape is well felt. Yeah. You know? It could be as simple as triangle. It could be as not simple as Deleuze, right? And it's okay. Yeah. But the process is more or less the same. It's like, like a seeking the shape of it. And these shapes are you know, it's like flesh uh, or something. There's like a connecting flesh that feels in both sides and reverses back and forth. That there's something yeah. about that recognition. I got this sense of like, yeah, the, the blob coming out. And, you know, here's, let's just say there's the, the conforming with the blob. And that for there's some mysterious some mysterious thing where it's like so at first the blob goes like this and it goes like that it goes in some sense unrecognized, but then at some point there's some kind of reconfiguration where the the blob is simultaneously the hand over here. It's like they go to both sides, right? There's some mm-hmm. kind of yeah because precisely because that thing about you know, how we perceive anything at all is by no means um, a clear, (laughs) a clearly answered thing, but we definitely don't perceive immediacy in terms of like sense data, right? It's not little units of data. It's, It's whatever it is that the child gets initiated into right, in that reconfiguring of consciousness that, that allows it to recognize a domain that then colors can be disclosed. But it's not sensing just the data. There's something else going on there. It's more like it's the face of the world comes up, right? It's like, like uh, I, I would imagine, especially, especially when we're children, and I would imagine on some primordial level, we, it all, all starts here, like the world seems to be always, the world is always already the face of the world, right? The, there's a long time ago, so long ago, I can't even remember, but there was some, I was watching a movie and there was some kind of creature that was invisible. 
Um, and so you couldn't see it, right? By definition, it's invisible. Yeah. But of course, you could perceive its impact on the world. You could see the grass moving away, mm. or the raindrops, right? There's the raindrops. And so there's something, that's what kept coming up for me. There was something like the, uh, the beingness is intrinsically invisible and yet is also exclusively that which is the producer, the cause mm. of the changes in that which is visible. I'm using the word visible here now quite broadly. Yeah. And so the sense data or the, the perception in the, in the, in the yeah. mode of the visible yeah. is used to orient towards a different faculty, which is able to perceive in the invisible. And that's yeah. what you might call a geometry of consciousness, something like that. Right. So there's like a, a mode that is appropriate or a faculty that's appropriate to the mode of being or the mode of the transcendent, yeah. which the mode of perception, the mode of the, what Ford would call the omniscient, mm. um, you know, the sense data or whatever, mm. orients, allows or supports, but is not the thing. Yeah. Just like now. Right? The words yeah. are not the thing. Words are, yes. in many ways, slightly non-random sound waves. Yeah. But there's a way that they allow us to enter a shared space of consciousness. Right. That both, in some sense, has this double sense of they both reveal and conceal, right, at the same time. Like there's a there's something about concealment and under underlying underlying this that's just um, quite, I can kind of hear it a bit of that in some sense, it's like, there's a, there's a relationship that your daughter has with concealment that is, um, that is profound, right? You want to say more? Yeah. This, I think it's something like, it's, I guess you could put it like this. It's like the way that um, uh, Yo-Yo Ma talks about music, right? Where he says, you know, you'd think that I play sound. I don't play sound, right? I actually play silence. That all the mm -hmm. sound, right, is, and especially this is, this is really exemplified in, in sound because it's it's evanescent right it's hard to say that you actually ever hear sound it's more like you hear you know if you listen you can hear the space at the end of each sound right it's like at the end of each sound, you can almost you can almost feel like the a little pop of the bubble of the, the unmanifest but it's more like the sound conditions the silence right and I think that's the way how we understand music. So I would say that in some sense, right, your daughter, you know, and also speaking kind of metaphorically in this primordial way, that our comportment with silence itself seems to be so native, right? So native that... Um, And especially when you think about it in terms of, of from that vantage point, language, right? If we have say a silence being, right? A non-foundational sense of depth under things, right? Or below things and through things in the silence, then it seems like language can be something that um, in some sense discloses the infinite, like the, the, the discloses new forms of intelligibility and reveals new forms of intelligibility from that non-foundational sense of depth, right? Ah, yeah. right. Okay, hold on. This, this, so the... Good. I, knew, I was hoping that would be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like way on the, on the edge of the <laughs> ah right the, the, shoot uh, I, I know that this has been part of our conversation today uh -huh. but I'm brought into 
this weird, this weird space that's increasingly part of my reality, which is like this, the field of conversation that's been present over you know, the past say, couple of weeks mm-hmm. where I can't even identify who, when, or where. It's like yeah. this blob. This, this thing, yes. <laughs> thing. Like literally feels like that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So I, it, there was a period of time we call it the hyper conversation. So let's maybe dust that off and use it again. It feels so uh, 2021. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> Big Bang, yeah. the creative principle. I mean, we talk about the aspects of the of of the of the sacred. Right. The, the recognition, the recognition, and this is I mean obvious. It feels very obvious, but I think it needs to be hammered. Like. Mm-hmm on anvil style hand for hammer the, the big bang didn't stop 13 billion years ago mm. the big bang is a fundamental aspect of reality always yeah all the time. yeah the continuous process and right? is the presence of the possibility mm-hmm. of full stop mm-hmm. and and there's in fact an actual trajectory that is a yeah. historical arc Right? So yeah. the presencing of possibility does not embody itself in ducks 13 right. billion years ago. It embodies itself as quarks. Well, that was not an intentional pun, but I like it Yeah. Um, in that time frame. But there's a, an unfolding, but the unfolding always happens in the context of the fundamental presencing of possibility, right? the mystery, yeah. the transcendent, the sacred, the creative principle, the aspect of the sacred that we were calling the creative principle. Mm-hmm. And so... You know, we've got this kind of nice, crunchy, in unesthetic, anesthetic language, like the adjacent possible. So it always precedes an embodiment by the adjacent possible. It can't teleport from A to Z. It has to go through the alphabet to get there one by one. Yeah. But in some sense, it's also always there. Right? There's a, the, the thing, the possibility, the, 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 that which brings into life is always there. And, um, Okay, so then language. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like clay, hand, man, man. Just to think about that. It's funny. I, I, uh, I have the sort of the, um, the, uh, the artistic frustration with the mistaking of man as being male when it means hand, right? Mm. Like manual shift. And to manipulate means to move, you use your hands yes. to do. Yes. The, the, to, call it, to call us humankind yeah. is to be called the ones that have hands, the handy ones, the ones yeah. that manipulate the world with, with skill and intentionality. Yeah, grasp. Right, grasp, mm-hmm. not connected to masculine or male. Yeah. In, in yeah. Any, like, totally different you know, <laughs> etymology. I never made that connection with manual ma- yeah hand i never <laughs> so I know, made that connection yeah. not present huh. um which makes the word of a handyman a funny uh like uh <laughs> well, yeah it twice yeah yeah uh, so we have then inst- uh paint paint uh, paintbrush paints guitar language hmm. yeah Muse, music, ally, friend, tool, techne, token, some aspect of the real, some aspect of reality that affords a particular facility for accentuating the capacity of men to participate in the mm, creative principle. Yeah. And it's... uh, you know, very, it's, you know, language like those Waldos, yeah. you, know, you put your hands and you got to manipulate. It's like a yeah. Waldo You're going through the membrane of the, of the visible into the invisible yes. and allowing, facilitating a way of grasping and, and yes. you know, manipulating, but now yes. producing it, right? Yes. And that interface layer, man, that's a big deal. The, the interface layer between the, uh, the visible and the invisible. Yeah. 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 Manifest and the manifest, which are two ways of saying the same thing. Yeah. Sometimes we've got to say it right away so we know that we're not. Right. You know. Right. But that doesn't mean we can't be in relationship with it. It doesn't yeah. mean that there isn't a, a way of, of, of 
I mean, relationship is the only word we can, interaction. There's no yeah. another way of interaction. It's just a particular way. Yeah. It's, it's that kind of thing. It has its own, its own, own ways. And um, hmm. I think this is like a big, a big part of the core lesson, you know, super lost in, in the West in particular. Hmm. And we all too often identify the words as the thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is funny because there's lots of creativity going on and every creative person, if they reflect on it, knows that there's something that they're doing that has to do with this characteristic of yeah. developing a skillfulness of operating in the unmanifest, of operating in the invisible. Yeah, yeah. And this, on one level, this, this relationship with the invisible, right? This relationship with the unmanifest or the silence, huh. I think that I think that there's some way that right now the place that most people experience that right is the abyss lurking <laughs> that they're mm -hmm. that they're um making sure to idle to not experience right this but I think that's what I was trying to get at a little bit was this sense in which there's there's some way that it seems to me that that silence is constituting of speech, right? Um, and visibility seems to be constituted by the invisible, and that that it's all woven together in these in these deeply um, uh, deep ways. Yeah. It's like. Oh, I, it's it's so clear right now. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. It's, okay. So the metaphor, the the kind of the walking up is, you can start with. I think you've probably done this. I think many people have. You you're you're at the beach and you're right at the level where the sand is is very very close to the water, so it's very liquid. Yeah. So you can dig a hole, but the hole fills back in. You dig a hole, and the hole fills back in. Yeah. And what you notice in that metaphor is the, the, um, the more fundamentalness of the beach. Mm. And the whole is a shift in the shape of the beach. Yeah. Right. It's not yeah. a thing. The whole is yeah. not a thing. The whole is a shift in the shape of the thing. The thing is the yeah. beach. Okay. Yeah. Next the lightning bolt, right? The sound of thunder. Yeah. That first what has to happen is that the air is there. Right? Yeah. And the lightning bolt creates a space, another like a hole in the air, and then the air collapses back in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, the next one was a lot more tricky. Let's see. It's something very straightforward, which is that the invisible mm, is like the ocean. The invisible is the whole thing. Mm. The invisible is foundational. The invisible mm. is the, the base. Music. I take the note and I pull, mm. pluck the string. What does it do? Right? There's sound, but as you say, it goes yeah. to silence, but it goes to silence. Well, but it came from yeah. silence. It came from silence and it goes to silence. The silence is that which is before. Yeah. Right? It precedes and it is after. It yeah. is larger than, it is more than, it is more fundamental. The silence is yeah. more fundamental than the sound. The sound yeah. is like the carving out of the hole in the sand. Right. And then the return to silence is the filling back up. Yeah. And so we, we, when we create, we're creating out of the invisible. There's a, yeah. a temporary moment where we pull out of the invisible right. and there's some process whereby we are really able to relate to the visible and we render visible. Yeah. Um, but it's made out of invisible and it shall always return to invisible. From dust to dust, it's from invisible to invisible or yeah. our end manifest. Yeah. Um, and that I think, that shifts things, right? Because now the abyss is, um, well... Mm. Death. Still can be scary. Still can be scary, but it changes yeah. your relationship. Yeah, it's, it's it's I think it's like it's the it seems you know in some way you know the in to put it like in the way Heidegger talked about it you know philosophy was essentially a conversation where being the understanding of being was for the sake of grounding beings right? Which is really interesting to think about, right? 
So at some point, we did it, hmm. right? The problem is, well, the, I don't know if it's a problem, but the situation is, is if you use a being, you use it all up, all on grounding beings, then beings are faced with what? They stand, okay, they're, they're on the ground, so they stand on the ground and they're now having to confront what? Non-being, right? Mm. And so there's this, there's this kind of move that, that Heidegger takes the second, you know, talks a lot about, and, it's, and he's talking about, essentially it's like the fissure or the opening right within this is to for the first time be able to as he as he would call it to think being itself without beings yeah right yeah and and here i think he's honestly i really do think he's really just double clicking on that particular aphorism of nietzsche's yeah, yeah. which i wish i could kind of do chapter and verse but that's not something i've ever done with with that but it's where he nietzsche very specifically points out that um yeah. How did it work? I mean, in some sense, to God, death of God, that, that move, but he yeah. wasn't using that phraseology. It's like, it's actually in, impossible in principle to have actually encountered non-being. Yeah. You know, because non-being is infinite. <laughs> so yeah. you can't run out. But, yeah. but what you can do is you can lose your connection with it. Yeah. And you can become myopic. You can begin to... Yeah. Or focus on being the yeah. as, and you lose your continuity of contact. Yeah, you get distracted, yeah. you get confused, you get overwhelmed. Yeah. Right, this is the busyness, the buzzing, and this yeah. is the you know whatever you want to call the flies in the marketplace. Is that whole scene and the, the critique of modernity, the situation we find ourselves in, when where there's just like a super uh, overwhelm mm. of mm, the sarcophagus, it's noise, you know, from music yeah. to noise. Right? Yeah. And I have my string and I pluck it in yeah. proper relationship with silence. I have created music. Yeah. But beyond that, as certain, you know, if I start having more and more strings and I start plucking them and plucking them and plucking them, I break something and I move yeah. into a space of noise where I cannot discern silence any longer. Yeah. Now I'm looking at the sound as if I'm, pl- as if that's music, you know, back to Yo-Yo Ma. Right. Hey, you, you play sound. So more sound, let's make more sound. But what you don't realize is you never played sound ever, ever played sound. Yeah. Um, but you, you've now I've lost it. Now it's all noise everywhere. And all you can hear is noise. Uh, and you now forgot that there was ever silence in the first place. Cause you're surrounded by noise. And right. that's the problem of the forgetting you become lost right. in the noise. You forget. Yeah. Now you feel, now that's the feeling. That's the feeling of dread right there. That's the There's feeling nihilism of, right there. There's all nihilism pure right contingency, there. all pure contingency. Yep. Yeah. Totally. Yep. Which is, you know, and the antidote to nihilism is just to remember. Yeah. Just right. to slow down. Right. Make less that, noise. <laughs> just not making so much noise. And that's the strange thing about this time. And, and I think it's also psychologically, I mean, it's the case for, it's been the case for me. It's like those deeper connections to being have oftentimes been about like, say some, psychological defensive thing that I'm working on, right? Or that comes up and then it, there's, you know, going along and of course that psychological defense is some some kind of like uh, defensiveness against being, right? Um, and then at some point mm. that, at that some point that the payoffs of it, right? Are too painful or, or, or the balance doesn't work and a guy goes, all right, okay, let's look at this, right? There's usually this quality of confronting some kind of um, vague, hollow, nihilistic kind of nothing. And if I'm fortunate enough and I can open to it and stay with it, there's something about that 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 oftentimes that not that nullity starts to like reveal itself as like spaciousness, right? As the silence, right? And and then from there, it's like, oh, it's obvious the whole time. <laughs> like, why did I ever even 
right? Yeah. But yeah. there's this kind of there's these there's this kind of feeling. I remember that that was the first time I um I went to a meditation retreat at Vipassana. It, the first three days, like I sat there and I got in touch with this agitation under the surface. And of course you, you sit there in silence for 12 hours a day. Right. So you can't move, you can't run from it. Mm -hmm. but, but I was like, there was an agitation, right. Um, that I realized in seeing that I'm like, Oh my God, almost everything I do is in some level trying to not experience that experience. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And of course, sitting with it, sitting with it, sitting with it, it's actually in some sense, it's a, it's a, it's a place where silence can begin to speak, but I have to develop the ears to hear it. Right. Mm -hmm. And at some point there's something about sticking with it that, you know, psychologically feels like it opens, it opens everything up. Right. Mm -hmm. That sense of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this like complex of, um, like some com combination of characteristics around wrong relationship or, or failure to achieve right relationship with death. And also the increasing presence of kind of ubiquitous distraction. Yeah. So no, no relationship with silence. Mm -hmm. yeah, so if as a child, you don't develop right relationship with silence, yeah. one of the consequences is that you never also develop the capacity to have right relationship with death. Yeah. Um, and that yeah. would, that would then tend to create a certain, uh, hysteria. I was, I was, what came into my mind was like, one of the things that we're dealing with as a civilization is that the, the boomers are panicked out of their minds, with the reality of their mortality, mm. um, because as a, as a generation, broadly speaking, of course, they, um, didn't achieve right relationship with death. And some part of that is because they live as one of the first generations that was truly, really jacked, like super saturated with distraction. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And of course we have, we've just turned up the dial on that. Yeah. Like even look at our poor Gen Z. Yeah. Um, how many nanoseconds can they go before the phone comes out? Right. Um, right. And I am, I'm, I'm a sinner, so I'm not, I'm not a, claiming yeah. anything better than that i'm very much in that same domain mm -hmm. um but there's something about that and there's something about that reality that you're not going to be able to navigate the reality that we happen to literally be in yeah. we're mortal beings man so it's up yeah we, yeah we are the finite in the context of the infinite yeah we're coming yeah. from the infinite we return to the infinite that's how it works that's that the, not the able to that not is the thing yeah. to start tuning into. Yeah. 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 And, and, and like learn, like, as you said, there's that three days, day three Vipassana where the distraction instinct has to actually. Yeah. Loosen. Yeah. It has to say, oh, uh, fuck. Yeah. Okay. Silence. Well, yeah. what's up? <laughs> yeah. And then it's like, Oh, okay. Silence. And then that, that ability to realize that silence and death are isomorphic. They're the same thing. Mm -hmm. The yeah. string, the music, that sound that you hear, the sound yeah. of silence, it's the sound of death. Yeah. That's the sound of the entropic decline of the structure of the pattern that has been pulled out of, of the yeah. invisible, out of silence into manifest, returning back into the equilibrium state of the invisible. Right. Which is the same thing as death. There is no right. difference. They're identical. Right. Your own death, you might think of as being a bit more serious than the death of a C sharp minor, but not from the point of view of the C sharp minor, yeah. um, nor from the point of view of the silence. Mm. and um i get the feeling like the thing that's landing very heavily is that a gigantic part of the of the lesson that we are faced with right now as a as a human family is to return to right relationship with death yeah 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 absolutely mm -hmm. and so thinking about kind of bringing you back in that um I'll call it a tutoring that you're speaking to um, of holding with your daughter, right? Don't just hold, but actually check. Mm -hmm. 
like yeah. in that check in I, I'm struck by actually this moment of checking and waiting, feeling into waiting. Mm. Right. That is already in some sense a communication, mm. right? That but yeah. I think maybe the thing that's communicated is something like silence. That's a little moment right. where Yeah. Well, it's 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 what I would say is something like of the refinement of the invisible faculties. Yeah. Yeah. Wait. Yeah, bring those to the foreground. <laughs> right. Remember, we didn't say that we didn't say the infinite was nothing, but that's the whole point. Yeah. Right. It's not, it's not that silence is is nothing. It's not the silence is in the abyss in sort of the negative sense. Right. It's the creative principle. There's a whole faculty, yeah, a whole set of faculties that are associated with that. It's so yeah. It's inexhaustible. And yeah. it's um, and there's a way, and it's and it's hmm, one can become skillful at and participating yeah. and can start to respond to deeper and deeper layers of it. And in that response, yeah. unconceal, reveal new forms of intelligibility, right? Sure enough. Yeah. yeah. Like I think about this a lot too, about there's these, you know, in some sense, I, I hear, I hear this and correct me if I'm wrong, but I hear this in your, sensibility around things like at some level like the train has left the station right mm -hmm. technicity it's like things are going the way they're going right and there's something in me that, that something in me in me that's like noticing i'm i'm kind of feel at my i feel filled with critiques mm -hmm. about right there is something about like, well, let's, as, as my, as my philosopher friend says, let's, let's, let's build something, right? The, where are the openings, the fissures, right? In all of this techni technicity that we can, that we can start to respond to. Where is, where is the silence, right? Hmm. You could say civium may very well be a, be a response to that silence, right? Blockchain may be one, right? Uh, you know, who knows, but he's, and it's, and it's directly well, about this sense about, yeah, dwelling, actually dwelling within the uncanny, right? Blockchain is, is interesting. And by the way, I just noticed I have, we got to, got to end it go. soon. Okay, cool. Four minutes. Um, I have to put a frame on it. It's new. Since it's new, we have the ability to perceive what birth looks like. We have the ability to perceive something about the more basic or the natural emergence of the creative principle into being. It, it's moving fast. It will, it will accelerate from silence into music into noise quite rapidly. Yeah. So it will you know, grow old and it will die in a time frame that I might even witness, right? And I'm pretty old. Certainly the young people who are part of it will definitely witness it. It's not going to last a thousand years. It's going to last 20. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Just because that's the kind of thing it is, right? It's a mayfly. You can whoosh. So yeah. if you focus on the embodiment and like you lose track of it, well, you're going to get kind of lucky because you'll get ejected out, ejected out of it in not too long. By the way, it may be massively entraining the whole of the world. So it may be a little bit of a uh, in that. But if you focus on the way it's being embodied, right? you focus on the, the felt sense, the way that it can train you to orient towards the creative principle, like those mm -hmm. subtle things yeah. and how it's an example of something that you can see everywhere now. And it's a training harness yeah. to learn how to become skillful at that. There's actually yeah. two directions that it goes, right? One direction is the direction of those who become captured by the, the artifacts. Yeah. And those who are liberated by the artistry. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Really good connecting with you, my friend. Yeah. I particularly like the time we spent with the little one. That was. Uh, yeah. Me too. Me too. All yeah. right. Well, blessings on you and your, your family. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that you guys are now in the, how old is your, uh, your child now? Six weeks.
Six weeks. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Beautiful he's time. A little, he's a little Buddha. He really is. He's just so chill. Yeah. Just keep giving him the, the space. Yep. An yep. unending delight. And in my experience, unending frustration too, but that's just because that's my karma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. All right, my friend. All right, brother. Bye-bye. Bye.